Hello everyone. Before we get into today's episode, we'd just like to thank all of our patrons, our executive producer, Jeremy Marcou, and all of our listeners for their support. If you would like to help support the show with a dollar a month, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash histories most. Or if you would like to become an executive producer like Jeremy, you can donate $5 a month as well. Thanks so much for all the support and on with the episode. Imagine a democracy founded on the most unsteady ground conceivable. It starts with a defeated nation at the end of its tether in the dying days of World War I. A mutiny of sailors, refusing to sacrifice their lives for a lost cause, quickly spreads to cities all over the country. Seeing this growing unrest and dissatisfaction with not just the war, but also the current monarchical system, the government steps aside in favor of a republic. But this new administration inherits a plethora of issues and a to-do list longer than your arm. They've just lost a world war. There's a breakdown of essential services. There's constant protests in the streets, and violent armed extremists from left and right calling for their heads. This is the beginning, history's most precarious democracy, the Weimar Republic. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex. And, well, uh, after a bit of a break in terms of uh, the way our episodes have been structured, we've done a lot of interviews um, in the last few months. um, And it's been really brilliant, I think, to speak to so many experts and uh, enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're back to our traditional format. Yeah. uh, With Peter. Just the two of us today, um, like you say, it has been a little bit of time since we last did one, just the two of us, so it's good to get back to our roots. Uh, but don't worry, everyone, we, there will be more interviews on the way, it's just a matter of scheduling and a whole bunch of other different stuff, So, but they, they, there will more will be coming. But for now, we figured that we'd uh, talk about something that we both know a little bit about Yes, we are doing another series. We did a series on 20th century Spain um, at the start of this year. And this time we are going to also be looking at the fractious and polarised interwar period, but we're going to be looking at Germany instead. So Mm -hmm. we're going to do a a series over the next few episodes telling the story of the Weimar Republic. This is a pretty fascinating uh story of uh, unsteady foundings and it does it ties into some of the stuff that we talked about in our very first episode on Eric Ludendorff yeah absolutely there'll be um quite a few things that kind of cross over i think um with our study our portrait of mm. eric ludendorff and i think um you know at various points i might well say look this is something we covered when we talked about eric ludendorff and so yeah Episode one of History's Most um, is also a good place to start. Yeah, so if you haven't listened to that, then uh, we recommend that you go back and listen to that if you get the time. And and make sure that you do have some time because it's two hours long. (laughs) Yes, before we (laughs) realized editing was a thing. (laughs) And also, I think that um, the Weimar Republic and the Second Spanish Republic have uh, some similarities. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, yeah. I think there's there's a lot of parallels, and and you know it's in both cases, countries experimenting with parliamentary democracy for the first time, in a very fractious environment. Mm. Well, how does this environment start? Well, where is this? Where do these fractures lie? Because there's a lot of background with the Weimar Republic. Absolutely. I mean. We should kind of start, I guess, before the First World War, mm. when Germany was uh, 
a kind of semi-authoritarian state, if you like. It was it was much more um, power was vested in the person of the Kaiser. Um, Germany was a young country, relatively speaking. It had been founded in 1871. Um, and an important aspect, I would say, is that it was founded through war and conquest by the Kingdom of Prussia, um, co-opting and conquering other German states. And eventually, um, you know, the King of Prussia was crowned Kaiser Emperor, literally Caesar, mm. um, Wilhelm I of Germany as a whole, the German Reich, the German Empire in 1871, after the defeat of um, France in the Franco-Prussian War. And so that meant that, you know, the birth of Germany, and that helps explain a lot, I think, about German history, the birth of Germany is brought about by war and conquest, by strong leadership from, you know, semi-authoritarian rulers, and, of course, you know, the policies of the Iron Chancellor, the Kaiser's head of government, uh bismarck um who you know was pretty ruthless definitely clever as well um and so germany had its roots in basically this strong authoritarian right-wing leadership that had provided it with its success with its birth with its unification and obviously therefore for for germans who had grown up, you know, most of the Germans we'll be talking about in this series grew up in the late 19th century. Mm. Um, and that was the world they were born into. Yeah, it'll have a so I think big impact on them. Yeah, for sure. But then, of course, you've got the First World War. And that kind of destroys the system that uh, we've kind of described. You had, before the First World War, a Reichstag, a parliament, that was um, obviously elected by by men over 25 was the rules. And there were certain restrictions on the franchise designed to give the more powerful classes more of a say. But nevertheless, um, you had a parliament, but it was merely advisory. Um, ultimately, the government, headed by the chancellor, was selected by the Kaiser. So he chose the variety of his own inner circle of civil servants, that sort of thing, to run the government for him. It wasn't like a democracy where a certain party wins the most seats in parliament, therefore they form the government. Hmm. You know, the parliament was just there in an advisory manner, and it was the Kaiser who hired and fired governments. So what decisions are made by the Kaiser that impact the First World War? Well, there is a quite controversial, I think remains quite controversial in history in terms of the role Germany played and the Kaiser personally played in the start of the First World War. But what you can say with certainty is he was very, you know, bellicose. He was very aggressive at the very least in his rhetoric and that Germany in its backing of Austria-Hungary, the so-called blank check of telling the Austro-Hungarian government, go for it, do, you, do what you want in the Balkans and we'll support you is obviously a big um, factor in triggering that conflict. And once the war begins, um, what you actually see is over time, the systems that have been put in place in the Kaiserreich, the, the Imperial Germany, um, begin to break down. And there's lots of reasons for that, but one of the most stark is the growing power of the military. And particularly once Hindenburg and Ludendorff take over uh, in August 1916, the uh, hoarding of power by the Army Supreme Command, um, which basically renders the Kaiser a figurehead because it becomes the army who can dictate policy to the government, who can even remove chancellors that they don't like, which they do on several occasions. You already get this system, I would say, you know, of... Bismarck's vision of Germany is already breaking down, politically speaking, during the First World War because of how much power the army gets and how much he really, the Hindenburg and Ludendorff take the prerogatives away from the Kaiser um, into their own hands. 
for the sake of the war effort, as they would see it. Mm. But that's where you begin, I would say, to get the idea, the, the breakdown of the old Bismarckian constitution. And of course, um, very soon, the decisions that Hindenburg and Ludendorff make are going to lead to the breakdown of the whole monarchy. Um, and obviously, you know, that's something we, you know, their, their politicking, if you like, is something we talked about a lot in our in our Ludendorff episode. Hmm. Yeah, the, for context, we'd recommend that you refer back there because there's a lot of stuff that happens in the later years of the war which lead directly to the loss of uh, the German military and the breakdown of the German government. Absolutely. And we go into detail in the Ludendorff yeah. episode about the military decisions he made that led to defeat. Um, but I guess it's worth providing a little um, insight into it for the sake of our story today. Um, basically, Ludendorff um, went for an all-out offensive in 1918 to try and win the war, and it failed. Um I'm going to quote um, Tim Travers, a historian of the First World War. He kind of sums it up, a uh, quote, a, a bit of length here. He says the German army was really defeated by the summer of 1918, partly due to the cumulative effects of the wearing out of the army from 1914 to 17, and partly due to the desperate efforts of the Allies in bringing the, those German offensives I just talked about to a halt. But it can also be argued to a considerable extent that the German army defeated itself through its own offensives from March to July, because these offensives led to excessive casualties due to poor tactics, and because the OHL, that's the Supreme Command, employed an unwise strategy. Uh, German morale also suffered a crippling blow in the spring and summer of 1918 because of heightened expectations from these so-called peace offensives that were not fulfilled. This defeat was hammered home by the French counterattack on 18th of July and the Amiens offensive of 8th of August, followed by the constant attacks and mobile warfare of late August, September and October 1918. In the end, German casualties were so heavy and the loss of morale so decisive as a result of the German 1918 spring offensives that the German army began to disintegrate in mid-July. So, you know, very briefly, that is, is why... Germany ends up in a situation by the second half of 19 that it is facing a catastrophic military defeat. Hmm. So we can see this division between the soldiers on the front and the plans of Ludendorff. And I think a good place that we could, uh, we could talk about is uh, the Kiel mutiny, which would be a good example of... Uh, this breakdown between what the government wants and the war plans and what the people want. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is definitely a sense that the Kaiser Hindenburg and Ludendorff in Supreme command were really detached by this stage from the feelings of the frontline troops and the civilian population. Um, Nevertheless, by the end of September 1918, Hindenburg and Ludendorff realised the war is lost. Um, there is, it is put about, it's, I wouldn't um, say it's for definite, but Ludendorff basically loses his nerve, maybe even has a nervous breakdown. And they tell the government, they tell the Kaiser that the war is lost and we need to negotiate a peace or at least an armistice, a ceasefire, for a few months so that we can recover because otherwise we're going to collapse militarily. This leads to um, an attempt to A, extract peace or a ceasefire at least from President Wilson of the United States and B, to reform the governmental system in order to probably secure better peace terms but also to remove responsibility for negotiating peace from the army high command. So in the so-called October reforms, or it's also known as sometimes the revolution from above, uh, Ludendorff um, persuades the Kaiser to carry out a kind of semi-democratization where they remove the chancellor and they appoint a new chancellor, Prince Max of Baden, who's known as quite a progressive 
um, German royal. He's been engaged in mostly like charity work with the Red Cross during the war, mm. as opposed to the kind of warmongers. Um, and he is appointed chancellor at the head of a government whose ministers, whose cabinet is drawn from the parties of the Reichstag. So for the very first time, Germany has what is approaching a parliamentary democracy in the sense of, you know, the parties who've got voted into parliament are forming this government. The Kaisers remained and Hindenburg and Ludendorff have remained, but this, you know, this is probably like a, um, you know, a, a, a exercise in optics hmm. in trying to show the Western allies, um, the Entente powers, uh, look, you know, we have changed. This is a new Germany now. Who are you negotiating with? We're like you. After all, they were fighting democratic powers. And they hoped that that would persuade the idealistic President Wilson to give them fair terms, if you like. Right. At the same time, though, it was not just, uh, you know, a piece of realpolitik. It was also very nefarious. You know, at the end of September, Ludendorff told his staff, well, now we can give responsibility for the peace and you know, by extension, the defeat to the people who've undermined us all along, the democratic politicians, you know, the civilians on the home front. Stab in the back, myth. Exactly, which we talked about a lot when we talked about Ludendorff. So straight away, he's laying the foundations for this myth, this fiction, this lie that will come to dominate Weimar politics, that the First World War, the defeat was down to betrayal on the home front. And the way you do that is you get the civilians to negotiate the peace. So Baden becomes chancellor on the 3rd of um, October, and he gets bombarded by Hindenburg and Ludendorff by requests to begin negotiations right away. Um, they say things like, the front won't hold for 48 hours if you don't. Mm. Um, so on the 4th of October, he sends what's called the peace note to President Wilson. But this has an explosive effect on the home front because the people back home have been fed a diet of war propaganda. You know, this, the press is censored. They only get positive news stories. Yeah. And, of course, the German spring offensives had, you know, captured a lot of ground. It got within, I think, about 50 miles of Paris. So uh, the German press had made a lot of that. You know, propagandists had really put it out there that Germany was on the brink of winning by the summer. And mm. the next thing they know... Yeah. You're Their government is for peace. Peace, or you know, they haven't defeated the enemy. They are on the point of capitulating. So it didn't make much sense um, to the German people. And of course, um, President Wilson responds, but he isn't. He isn't convinced that uh, these October reforms are true democratization, and he basically more or less lays down pretty severe terms in order to secure an armistice, really for two reasons. Um, the Allies were keen to maintain their military superiority. So what they didn't want was to sign a peace, uh, sorry, a ceasefire. And then two, three months later, once the Germans have caught their breath and dug into new defensive positions, the war to be resumed. Yeah. So they kind of insisted, like, look, if you want a ceasefire, we are going to have to occupy this territory, you're going to have to evacuate your troops, you're going to have to hand over this many weapons, because they wanted to maintain the strong military position they were in. The second part of Wilson's demands were about this political situation. Like I said, he wasn't convinced that this really was a new Germany, that they changed. Um, and he was more or less asser uh, asserting that, really, if you want to go and negotiate with us, the Kaiser's got to go. Because you know he, for the certainly for the for the West, was seen as a, or for the Entente, I should say, was seen as like this warmongering, um, absolute monarch. Mm -hmm. um, so by late October, it had become clear that the Kaiser and the old system was a kind of barrier to peace. Yeah, and so for the German people who'd been suffering for four years, millions of dead. Um, also, hundreds of thousands dying of starvation because of the Allied blockade of German ports, real hunger and suffering and malnutrition, disease uh, as well, outbreaks, not least the Spanish flu epidemic. Um, they were really fed up 
basically mm. the German people. And the fact that it appeared the Kaiser was now the barrier to securing peace and ending all this suffering um, obviously would be politically explosive. And like you mentioned, it really all starts with the German Navy because realizing that peace is on the cards, the officers of the German Navy decide that the best thing to do is rather than hand over their ships to the victorious allies, it would be better, more honorable to go out in a blaze of glory Mm. um, and to basically sail out and confront the Royal Navy in a final suicidal, um, you know, sally of, you know, let's just go down fighting. Yeah. And, well, you can imagine the reaction of sailors to this suggestion. Yeah. Um, I imagine it wouldn't be particularly popular. Um, and uh, from what I'm aware, it isn't. <laughs> no. I mean, if you think back to our other early episodes on the Battle of Tsushima, history's most disastrous naval voyage, this is only you know, 10, 15 years later. Ships, big warships that go down in this era, you know, you talk, you lose most, you know, most hands are lost, yeah. so to speak. Um, there's not good chances of survival if warships are sunk in this era. So you can imagine the ordinary sailors of the German Navy react extremely negatively, mm. <laughs> to say the least, to these proposals. And in late October and early November, there's a series of naval mutinies in the ports um, the naval bases of Germany's navy, where the sailors not only refuse orders, but eventually uh, arrest their officers. And on the 3rd of November, 1918, the revolutionary sailors in Kiel not only have taken over the naval base, but they march out into the city of Kiel and basically seize control. Hmm. Not... um, you know, not a small influence of this is the fact you had the Russian Revolution the year before, where workers and soldiers had created councils known as Soviets that had basically overthrown the power of the officers and the established government, and obviously finally led to the Bolshevik takeover of power. And you'd had worker unrest in Germany in 1917, particularly in January 1918, there'd been strikes. And there'd been a real breakdown in the, if you like, political consensus. Mm -hmm. Because since 1914, there'd been a real kind of everyone had got behind the war effort kind of thing. Um, Because Germany was fighting a world war. And also there was a perception among the population, true or otherwise, but nevertheless it was there, that they were fighting a defensive war. They were fighting for the survival of Germany against, you know, they were surrounded by Russia attacking them from the east and the french attacking them from the west mm. the british cutting them off by sea it was a kind of siege mentality and i'm sure the propaganda that told them we're fighting a defensive war didn't help uh, exactly um the trouble is from 1917 into 1918 it became increasingly clear because of the policies of hindenburg and ludendorff that that wasn't the case that they were fighting an aggressive war of conquest yeah. the treaty of brest litovsk Um, which we talked about a lot in the Ludendorff episode, showed exactly that, that Germany was trying in this war to establish a massive continental empire. And it's quite a lot harder to motivate your people to go through suffering and hardship for, you know, the purposes of conquest in faraway lands Mm. rather than the survival of the nation. So there'd been a breakdown in this consensus about supporting the war effort there had been in 1917 a um, uh, a motion passed by the Reichstag, which again, you know, the Reichstag was only advisory, but a motion passed by the parties of the Reichstag calling for a peace without annexations, basically like a return to 1914 borders, mm. which possibly could have happened in the winter of 1917-18 because um, the Allies were pretty exhausted, but the Supreme Command had absolutely no interest in that. Yeah. So this naval mutiny breaks out in the context of not only German shock and dislocation at the fact they've just realized the war is about to end and they're going to be on the losing side of it, but also a real breakdown in political unity and consensus because more and more Germans are beginning to feel like 
the military leadership has led them down the garden path and you know in their vain efforts to secure uh, a massive empire have led their country to catastrophic defeat i can understand why um it's uh yeah, to go through all that only to find out that, well, I mean, as we discussed in the Ludendorff episode, Ludendorff had uh, some pretty interesting plans for world domination, I think would be a good way of putting it. Um, I can't really think of any other uh, any other way of putting it, especially later in his life, but uh, you can see the seeds of that beginning here, where uh, he wants to create one great unified Reich. Yeah, I mean, his um, portrayal as an evil genius in the Wonder Woman film <laughs> is um, mildly entertaining, not particularly factual, but on that aspect of his personality, he, he was pretty um, megalomaniac. Mm. He was a Me- bit of a megalomaniac. I think that's not controversial to say. Yeah. Um, anyway, you know, for all these factors, the mutiny in Kiel becomes something so much more. And you get a remarkable, a genuinely uh, incredible um, breakout of mass uh, uprising and revolution, largely peaceful, must be said, across Germany. Uh, It just spreads like wildfire from city to city, starting with Kiel, not least actually because some of the sailors actually basically get on trains and start going to city after city, spreading the word. Mm. Um, And you get the the working class, and also troops garrisoned in Germany, taking to the streets and proclaiming um, revolution. Well, actually, this is a kind of controversial point. The perception, I think, often is that, yes, they were coming out on the streets and proclaiming revolution, and they were setting up workers' and soldiers' councils like the workers' and soldiers' Soviets in Russia. And these councils began to take over city after city, However, when you actually, and people who've studied the revolution um, really point this out, when you actually look at these councils, they are often made up of fairly moderate, um, you know, left-wing local politicians, Mm -hmm. usually from the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, which was a kind of, um, I would argue for all intents and purposes during this period, essentially centre-left party. Yeah. that really weren't calling for a Bolshevik revolution. What they were calling for was peace. And to achieve that peace, it was the abdication of the Kaiser. Um, So that was the primary aim of this revolutionary movement. And like I said, it's actually really remarkable how quickly it spread and gained mass appeal across, um, across the country. You had um, even in, you know, just a few days later, you had even in Bavaria, which is very Catholic and conservative, um, a massive protest in uh, the capital Munich, attended by hundreds of thousands of people, which kind of spontaneously marches on the royal palace, um, where the Bavarian um, king was officially resident in his government. Um, And basically the proclamation of a republic in Bavaria. Hmm. Um, just to clarify as well, you know, Germany was a federal system, um, which, you know, places like Bavaria, Prussia, et cetera, et cetera, were federal states within yeah. um, the unified German Reich. Um, and in the, you know, imperial period, each of those usually had a king or prince. Um, but afterwards, um, they became kind of democratic Um, after the revolution. Hmm. So it comes to a head on the 9th of November, 1918, where the crowds, um, you know, take over Berlin effectively. And the chancellor, Prince Max, um, realizes the situation is lost. There's no chance of saving the monarchy. The, you know, the revolution has triumphed, he basically concludes. So he... What he does is he announces the Kaiser's abdication without permission from the Kaiser. As we said, the Kaiser was at the military headquarters in Belgium. 
Um, so he announced for the Kaiser and very much against the Kaiser's will that that it was all over. And he then um, resigned as chancellor and handed over power to um, a guy called Friedrich Ebert, who was the leader of the Social Democratic Party I just mentioned. And as this was happening, another leading Social Democrat, a guy called Philip Scheidemann, had proclaimed from a balcony of the Reichstag to the, the enthusiastic crowds, he proclaimed, uh, Ger- you know, the German Republic. He basically announced the creation of the German Republic. Um, again, before anything had actually yeah, been all, down. All of this is being done without the Kaiser knowing. <laughs> yeah, it's all basically on the hoof. He's just seen the crowds and got whipped up with the enthusiasm and gone out and said, now, you know, we've created the German Republic. Mm-hmm. And Abbott, who'd just been handed the keys to the chancellery, um, comes to see him and says, what did you do that for? Um, because actually Friedrich Abbott, even though he was a social democrat, he was in his late 40s. Um, he had been a, a saddler, um, you know, a craftsman. Mm. The social democrats were very much a workers' party. You know, they were the political party of organized labor with strong ties to the trade unions. And that's how Abbott had got into politics through the trade union movement. But he was, you know, for all his, um, you know, center left politics and, and wanting political reform and parliamentary democracy and an improvement in the standard of living for the working classes. He was also a bit of a social conservative mm. in that he claimed he, he said famously that he hated revolution like sin. You know, he's very much a reformer rather than a revolutionary. And he also would have preferred to retain the monarchy um, in a form of constitutional monarchy, like, say, Britain had, um, you know, as a figurehead. Mm. That was his ideal solution to this problem. But because Scheidemann had, had just announced a republic, you know, you couldn't then go out and say, no, actually, and actually everyone... hold on. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my friend spoke too soon. We're, actually, we're not actually... We'd really like, you know, go out and tell the revolutionary... Masses. Yeah. Well, let's Look, let's, call, we let's all calm that. down here for a sec. <laughs> Have but you I guys considered person. reform? <laughs> exactly. Just so, one way to uh, get people a little bit angry. <laughs> yeah, Abbott had been catapulted to power unexpectedly. How I um, accidentally became chancellor. <laughs> yeah, he he literally did. He 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 had no part in the revolution. You know, he like I said, hated the idea of a revolution. In many ways, the October reforms that had created parliamentary government were probably his vision of, of, of what would be suitable for Germany in the coming years. So he was very much a political moderate, and he really felt like his responsibility now was to try and bring back stability and order and just kind of tame these revolutionary masses. Mm-hmm. He, he was pretty afraid of the workers and soldiers councils that had been established. Like I say, even though most of them were actually fairly politically moderate and just wanted the Kaiser to go and maybe it to be replaced with some sort of democracy. Now, the funny thing is, of course, I just said the Kaiser had no part in all this. Mm. Uh, he's out in the town of Spa in Belgium, which is where the military supreme command had its headquarters. And as the situation had gone south, there had been various plans by the Kaiser's inner circle about what to do. Um, There had been a scheme where they had thought, and the Kaiser had been all up for this, that the Kaiser would basically go to the front line Mm. and seek a soldier's death in the trenches. Basically, basically the Kaiser thought, it's all over. I want to die with my men at the front. Um, Oh, wow. Okay. And that hadn't come to fruition. Um, there had also been, and, and by 9th of November, the Kaiser was settled on the solution, which would be there'd been a revolution back home. He was angry with Prince Max, obviously, for announcing his, his abdication. And he and his inner circle very much planned to lead the defeated German army home from you know France and Belgium and use it to crush the revolution use it to put down the revolt and restore him to his throne. Right. The other solution, he thought, was I'll abdicate as Kaiser of Germany, but I will remain as King of Prussia. 
um, which again had no basis mm. in political realities. Yeah. And it was the sorry duty of the of the high command um, to tell him that this probably wasn't going to happen. There was no chance that he would be able to reconquer the homeland. Um, it basically, you know, he wanted a massive civil war. Um, yeah. So what happened was, uh, by this time, Ludendorff had been sacked. Again, we cover that in our episode on Ludendorff. And he'd been replaced by a guy called Wilhelm Gröner, who was a much more realistic general. Hindenburg remained, though. So Hindenburg and Gröner um, basically confronted the Kaiser on the 9th of November and tried to explain to him the, the realities of the new situation. Um, when Hindenburg was asked to speak to explain, you know, that it was going to be impossible to, to reconquer Germany, um, he, he choked. He couldn't speak. Mm. You know, he choked with emotion. So it was left to the unfortunate Gröner to explain to his supreme warlord um, the reality of the situation. He explained, you know, not only will the army not necessarily fight for you against the people, but to say the least, we're going to be cut off from our own supplies. You know, the revolutionaries control Germany. Yeah. Where are we going to get our food and ammunition? Um. And the Kaiser was really, and it, some of his advisors were really shocked and angered by this, um, to which Gruner replied, Sire, you no longer have an army. In circumstances like these, oaths are but words. Um, you know, so the oath of loyalty the mm. army had taken. Wow. So that, that, that night, the Kaiser fled into exile in, in the Netherlands. And you had a situation where the Kaiser was gone, and unexpectedly, the Social Democrats were in power. It's amazing how quickly this all happens. Yeah, and I think it took contemporaries by surprise. It was a very confusing and dislocating um, and, de- and, 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 you know, um, destabilizing set of events that, that all the certainties that had been in place for decades crumbled in, in days. Yeah. Um, what was uh, here's a question. What was Wilson's reaction to all of this? Well, the Allies were very much, um, you know, to some extent surprised by how quickly mm. Germany had collapsed, but also determined not to concede on their harsh kind of armistice terms as well. Mm. Um, so they weren't entirely convinced that Germany wouldn't restart the fight. So. Um, Basically, it fell to these new democratic politicians who'd been put into power to sign this pretty harsh armistice terms that Wilson had laid down um, on the morning of the 11th of November, which then, you know, the armistice kicked in at 11 a.m. on the 11th of November 1918, and that would be the end of the Great War. Mm. So we've reached the end of World War One. And Germany is entering into this new unknown territory. What happens next? Well, Chancellor Ebert, you know, faced a very tricky situation. And he is a very controversial figure Mm. today. And at the time, really. I, I would I would paint the picture, you know, sitting from his from his desk in the Reich Chancellery Mm. is that he has virtually no experience in governance and neither does his party because they've only been let into even the cabinet a month ago. Um, you have a situation where the country is collapsing around them. Mm. You know, there are protests on the streets. They have literally just lost a world war. You know, there is a breakdown of not just law and order, but essential services and as well as things like the food supply, you are going to have very, very soon millions of demobilized soldiers streaming home, potentially with weapons. Um, and you have, although the workers and soldiers councils that have basically taken control of each locality are actually mostly politically moderate, that isn't yet 100% clear to Ebert in Berlin. And of course, what had just happened in Russia is a 
two revolutions, actually, the February Revolution, which had installed a fairly liberal regime, followed by the Bolshevik Revolution that installed a communist dictatorship. Mm. And so Abbott thought, hang on, I've been put into power, but am I going to be the German Kerensky in which, you know, in a few months' time, the radicals, the, the you know, the communists, which did exist in Germany, are going to use the chaos to seize power. Yeah. And we could all be put up against a wall. Um, not only that, but you've got the fact that maybe the army and political establishment could well be hostile because they are, you know, the Kaiser's army. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They've just lost a war. Yeah, so... From Abbott's perspective, you have got 101 problems and very few positives. Yeah, I am kind of curious to see how he's going to actually wrangle all this into some manageable state. And I, I suppose the question is, does he actually do it? The great achievement, and people who view the German Revolution in a more positive light, say uh, Robert Gerwith, for example would argue that he actually does a pretty impressive job from that terrible hand he was dealt. Mm. His first step is on the 10th of November, so literally his you know second day in office. And what he does is he telephones the military supreme command and talks to the uh, General Gruner, who I just mentioned. Um, and the conversation basically has become known as the Ebert Groner Pact and is is like Ebert himself highly controversial. It is seen as either the move that saved Germany um from chaos and anarchy or um equally seen as like basically like a deal with the devil. Um what that telephone conversation well I I've got a kind of extract from it here um from Groner's perspective and he says in the evening, I telephoned the Reich Chancellery and told Abbott that the army put itself at the disposal of the government and that in return for this, um, the field marshal, that's Hindenburg, and the officer corps expected the support of the government in the maintenance of order and discipline. The officer corps expected the government to fight against Bolshevism and was ready for the struggle. Abbott accepted my offer of an alliance. From then on, we discussed the measures which were necessary every evening on a secret telephone line between the Reich Chancellery and High Command. We, the High Command, hoped through our actions to gain a share of power in the new state for the army and the officer corps. If we succeeded, then we would have rescued into the new Germany the best and strongest elements of old Prussia, despite the revolution. Right. So the reason this is seen as a little bit of a Faustian pact is that Abert, in his desperation, you know, in the fact that he controlled nothing really outside the government quarter of Berlin and that he was afraid of revolutionaries, does a deal with the old army and the old the old officers and agrees, you know, they are going to support Abert and his new government. They are going to back him. They are going to fight for him against Bolshevism. But in return, he has to leave alone and preserve the old officer corps, the mm -hmm. army, the German army of the Kaiser's Reich is going to stay pretty much unreformed. All the top, um, you know, figures are going to remain. And of course, these figures tend to be highly conservative, if not anti-democratic. And, you know, like I say, they're monarchists. They are loyal to the old system rather than any kind of new republic. Right. You say... Uh against Bolshevism. My question is, how prevalent was Bolshevism really in Germany at this time? Because you say most of the labor unions were center-left, but how much how much Bolshevism specifically actually was there? There's no doubt that it was a threat. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. a totally imagined threat, but equally, Abert overestimated it. Mm -hmm. Um then again, you can kind of understand why. So what happened was he had his Social Democratic Party, the SPD. There was also a slightly more radical variant, the Independent Socialists, who were the USPD, um, who wanted a not a parliamentary democracy, but a government that would be based on the council system that the revolution had created. Mm. And very quickly, the SPD and USPD fall out. And uh, in December, there is fighting in Berlin between uh, 
um, some of these radical revolutionary sailors who support power for the councils and government forces of Ebert, who basically would rather a parliamentary system rather than this kind of um, revolutionary council system. You also, though, have um, the Spartacists, um, who are who very quickly evolve into the German Communist Party, led by um, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. They are well; they're communists. They wanted um, to use the situation to spread communist revolution to Germany, and basically, obviously, to overthrow Ebert in that process. And in January, at the start of January 1919, they stage a series of strikes and protests that evolve into a full-blown uprising in Berlin. Mm. And although it fails, um, you know, with hindsight, we can see it fails and it's crushed. There's no doubt that it was a very serious uprising. The Spartacists managed to recruit about 15,000 troops to their cause many of whom were, you know, demobilized soldiers coming home who would have both fighting experience and weapons. So these were not just, you know, big crowds of workers on the streets. They had kind of paramilitary style units with with rifles, machine guns, that sort of thing. All right. And they, for a while, took control of parts of Berlin. And it was such a serious threat that the government forces, the regular troops that Gruner had at his disposal um, were probably not, were not sufficient um, to, to crush the Sparxists. And therefore, increasingly against these revolutionaries, the army, and by extension, therefore, the government called on their own paramilitary groups. And these were known as the Fry Corps. Mm. And the Freikorps, quite rightly, have quite a bad reputation. The yeah. Freikorps were um, militias, basically, of a mixture of both ex-soldiers as well as quite a lot of students who just missed out on joining the war um, because of their age. And they were overwhelmingly right-wing nationalists, even far-right, in their politics. And, you know, they were angered by the revolution. They were considered themselves enemies of communism. And so they were more than happy to take up arms against the government, uh, sorry, against the, the Spartacists and other left-wing revolts that were going on at the time. And they were particularly brutal because, well, they were not disciplined army units. You know, these were political, well, not really, more or less, you know, far-right militias mm. that were taking the fight against communism into their own hands with the sanction of the official army and the government, with arms and uniforms and equipment from the army and the government. And and, and I would put it like this. Um, basically, the through the ebert Groner Pact, this new democratic government um, armed hundreds of thousands of the radical right and basically released them onto the streets in order to crush Bolshevism. Wow. And they tend to do so with pretty brutal methods. Yeah. Um, the uh, the streets of Weimar Germany are uh, pretty pretty bloody in some areas, in some parts, yeah, of, uh, yeah. especially in this early phase. Um. You have the Spartacists are crushed with, with, you know, a lot of brutality in Berlin in January 1919. Mm. One of the Freikorps leaders, a guy called Captain uh, Vladimir Pabst, um, has Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, the two communist leaders, captured. They are arrested and then um, basically beaten to mm. death and shot and Luxembourg is, is thrown into a canal and not found for months. Um, so, you know, execution of prisoners was pretty standard practice because they viewed them as, you know, as is quite common in the interwar period, communists, and to some extent later as well, communists are viewed as this evil internal enemy mm -hmm. that must be purged. Um, 
a, you know, a threat to the very existence of the nation. Equally, um, there's a short-lived communist regime in Bavaria, in Munich. Um, the kind of republic that was created that I mentioned, you know, a little while back is overthrown by a, a group of communists um, who form what they declare as, as a, a, a Bavarian Soviet state. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the Freikorps, the, the actual official government forces, the army forces don't do very well in dealing with it. So the Freikorps are recruited um, to do so. And you have a lot of people um, who go on to be pretty important, I would say, um, later on, playing a playing a role in these Freikorps, not least um, one of the chief organizers of the Bavarian Freikorps that crushed these this Bavarian Soviet was a guy called Ernst Röhm. Mm. And uh, this is a quote from his memoir about um, the people who joined the Freikorps and, and what it was all about. He said, um, after the government in Bavaria approved advertising for the Freikorps, volunteers from all trades and callings in Bavaria hastened to enlist. They included former officers volunteering as rank and fire soldiers, students, high school boys, cadets, servicemen who had fought in the field, workers and farmers, um, although had one uh, inspiration which drove and bound them. It was a quasi-military community which looked to its leaders and was prepared to follow them blindly. Um, and, and when they actually took Munich and, and crushed this, this Bavarian Soviet, um, there was about a thousand people killed, most of them probably killed in cold blood. Um, that compares to 38 deaths among government forces. Mm. Um, so, you know, that wasn't really many combat deaths. I think it's pretty easy to analyze. Um, you had all sorts of atrocity stories. Uh, as they were storming Munich, they broke into a basement where there was a meeting of, um, you know, uh, craftsmen. And it was actually a Catholic church group. But they interpreted it as these revolutionary workers gathering. And the Freikorps killed 21 of them, beating them to death. Jeez. Um, you had um, the the Minister of Defence in the new government, a guy called Gustav Noska, was um, was a social democrat as well, but he um, proclaimed himself the bloodhound of the German Revolution, in that he was the kind of man who used mm -hmm. these far right paramilitaries to crush all opposition. Um, the late uh, William Peltz is his history of the German Revolution. He basically labels Ebert and Noska as um, extremists of the centre, in that you know yeah. they're politically moderate, but they are willing to use extreme violence to achieve their politically moderate aim of a parliamentary democracy. Yeah, um, I forget if we've used this term on the show before. Radical centrism is that a is, is that a good way of putting it? I mean, if, if it ever is applicable, you'd say this one maybe here is, is an example of mm. it. Um, the uh, just another one, another example, just to get you the the the, the idea of the spirit and the the um, the beliefs of the Fry Corps. Um, this is a letter that a student, you know, like I said, a lot of them were high school or, or university students who had just been too young to fight in the war and you know they'd been fed for years on nationalist propaganda mm. about the war and about heroism and sacrifice at the front the war's finished they're obviously bitter about defeat but now is the chance to fight for the fight for their country and so they fight join the fry corps and you know hope to fight for their country and for the flag against bolshevism well this is a letter one of them wrote um to um his parents of all people um, after he'd taken part in, in fighting in during 1920, actually, crushing another communist uprising in the Ruhr industrial region. Mm. And he wrote, um, if I were to tell you everything, you would say I was lying. No pardon is given. We shoot even the wounded. The enthusiasm is tremendous, unbelievable. Our battalion has had two deaths, the Reds, two to three hundred. Anyone who falls into our hands 
hands, first gets the rifle butt and then is finished off with a bullet. We even shot 10 Red Cross nurses on sight because they were carrying pistols. We shot these little ladies with pleasure, how they cried and pleaded with us to save their lives. Nothing doing. Anyone with a gun is our enemy. That is incredibly grim. Mm. And the fact that he's sending this letter to his parents, I mean, just shows the kind of radicalization that you saw among the youth at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just a case of embittered former soldiers. Yeah. It's also a lot of you know youth, like I say, who, I think you put it perfectly, are being radicalized by participation in the Freikorps and the internal battle in Germany, which more or less really amounts to a civil war yeah. um, in this revolutionary period. So amongst all this, by the way, um, Ebert held the first democratic elections in Germany. Ah, OK. What a, a perfect time for it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and these were held actually in January 1919, while all the Spartacus uprising was going on. However, they actually produce a clear majority for the pro-democracy parties, um, what becomes known as the Weimar Coalition, the three parties most committed to the idea of a new republican democracy, namely the SPD, we've talked about a lot already, um, the Centre Party, which actually wasn't a Centre Party, it was um, the name of the Catholic Party. Germany has a Catholic minority, about a third of the population at that time. And the centre, Zentrum, was uh, Germany's Catholic Party, which was fairly pro-democracy and fairly liberal at this time, um, which kind of is often at odds with what you would think about for a Catholic political party. But this is in no small part because um, the Catholics had often been persecuted under the Kaiser's regime. Um, Bismarck had carried out in the 1880s the so-called Kulterkampf, the culture war against the Catholic Church. Mm. So they were very much in favour of a kind of a liberal democracy where you'd have freedom of conscience. Um, and finally, the Democrats, the DDP, which was basically a liberal party. So those three parties won the election. Um, but the parliament couldn't meet in the Reichstag um, because of the chaos in Berlin, the violence that was going on with the Spartacus uprising. So instead, this new parliament assembled in a quiet, sleepy little town called Weimar. Mm. Hence, um, forevermore, um, this the regime they created would become known as the Weimar Republic. Mm. So these three democratic parties um, form the government. They form a new government together. They elevate Abbott from the chancellorship to the presidency hmm. um, through a vote in this new parliament. And they, uh, Scheidemann, by the way, I've mentioned already, became chancellor. And they also set about writing a new constitution as well. So what are the uh, the tenets of this new constitution? Well, Constitution writing isn't easy, is it? Mm. Um, I think that's a universally accepted truth. And just like a lot of things I've said so far this episode, the Constitution of the Weimar Republic is very controversial as well. Um, I know that I keep saying this, but the decisions that are taken, the actions of this frenetic period, 1918 to 19, are really debated among historians. There's no, you know, one singular consensus i would say on the positive side there's no denying that the weimar constitution was one of the most democratic um in the world at the time um and it really dragged germany from an authoritarian past into a you know hopefully liberal democratic future you know it guaranteed a whole set of rights and um, privileges that the German people had never enjoyed before. So universal suffrage for men and women over 21, freedom of speech, of, um, you know, assembly, hmm. the right to join um, a labor union and recognizing as well the collective bargaining power of unions, um, 
the you know freedom of expression around art you know removing censorship um that had been in place during the kaiser's time not just art theater um the press all these sorts of things so there's no doubt that this did represent a kind of brave new attempt to to forge a forge a new germany and equally the the um system of government was also designed to be thoroughly fair and democratic what you had was the the most of the power resided in the reichstag the parliament which was to be elected um by a system a party list voting system of proportional representation now uh, for listeners in you know the united states or the uk it's it's well understood that our voting systems um really do um well advantage the two main parties disproportionately so and um also mean that a lot of people's votes don't count if you see what i mean mm. um so if you live in a and these terms apply i guess both to the uk and america if you live in a red or blue area if you vote the other way it doesn't really make any difference and a proportional voting system is designed to overcome that so you know if a party gets 10% of the vote it'll get a roughly 10% of the seats in parliament um which like i say you can't fault it for fairness and democratic um merit mm and although a lot of people criticize the proportional system used by the weimar republic probably most democracies around the world use a semi proportional or proportional system um and yes it means that you're never going to get a majority so you're never going to get one party pretty much winning more than 50% of the seats and able to form a government on its own but, but on the other hand you'll have the that... smaller parties represented exactly so people get a voice yeah. if you know and people would say it's unfair if someone gets 40% of the vote and yet gets total power as happens in you know first past the post systems that's unfair cuz 60% of people have voted against that person mm. or that party so it, it is fairer in the very um, black and white sense of it and proportional systems have existed through history without it descending into total chaos mm-hmm. um so it's it's too simplistic to say well it was a proportional system so of course it was going to end in in tears um the problem though is that germany's political scene was really highly polarized um you know because of you've already got a sense of that i think from from what we talked about with the fry call mm. and from the left wing uh, communist uprisings so it meant that you know this proportional system would guarantee you got extremists getting representation um it meant that you would have pretty much for most of weimar's existence parties who were essentially anti-democratic or at the very least agnostic towards republican democracy are going to be in the majority in parliament which makes things difficult it means that coalition government is guaranteed you are always going to have to have governments that are a exist on the basis of cooperation between different parties and that can lead to instability and disagreements and kind of backroom deals and horse trading which undermines confidence in democracy equally it didn't have to you know there are countries that are exclusively governed by coalitions today and it doesn't have to destroy faith in democracy but again it's about looking specifically at the political culture and climate of germany at the time mm. at the very start of the episode we talked about the tendency towards authoritarianism and the fact that this is a brand new democracy um you know we haven't had generations of political norms to become established you know for cooperation and compromise to become normal um and the, the other real problem is that german political parties were highly fragmented and this was a legacy from the kaiser's era because the reichstag had been advisory it didn't really matter that you would have lots of small groups all saying we will represent this group in parliament we will represent that whereas of course you look at the uk or the usa you know the democrat and republican parties or the labor and conservative parties are very broad churches aren't they mm. they represent a very broad spectrum of political opinion 
Um, but the parties in, in Germany at the time did not do that. So I, I, I'll run you through very quickly the spectrum. Um, you had the communists on the far left, the social democrats, the moderate left that, you know, was really the party of organized labor. Um, the communists, the KPD, tended to be more popular among the really more destitute, the unemployed, the more casual laborers who, who perhaps didn't have the assurances of union protection. Hmm. German liberalism was split um, between the DDP, the Democrats who I already mentioned, who were a pretty standard issue liberal party, and the DVP, the People's Party, which was, um, I guess you might call it today, like neoliberal, in that it was very much the kind of capitalist version of liberalism. It favoured, you know, the interests of big business and heavy industry. Right. So essentially it was on the political right. Um, you had the centre, who I already talked about, who were a Catholic party. But equally, if you're not a Catholic, you're never going to vote for them. Um, if you're not working class, you're probably never going to vote for the SPD. Um, so these parties had a restricted support base, if you see what I mean. They had their base, but they were never going to appeal beyond that. Yeah. Um, you had the DNVP, which was um, known as the Nationalists, which was as you might expect, more of a right-wing party. Um, but they were often associated with the interests of landowners and agrarians. So again, that limited its appeal. And they were also pretty much opposed to the Republic. Um, so the you know they couldn't really play much of a constructive, positive role in political life. Um, you had a myriad of smaller groups on the right as well, um, who, you know, people like, the Nazi party who were going to become bigger later, but you basically had this massive fragmented scene of very small right-wing groups. Like you had parties representing, you know, peasants and farmers. You had parties representing um, the more Protestant Lutheran um, traditions within the German Christianity. You had parties representing, uh, there was something called the right party of the middle class, um, which was, trying to represent basically like the lower middle class, small business owner types, which, you know, today, if you suggested that, it would sound ridiculous. I'll set up a political party and was specifically going to represent small business owners. You think, well, you're never going to win more than 2% of the vote or whatever. But that didn't matter. They only needed to win 2% of the vote. They'd get some seats in the Reichstag and they'd represent the people that whose interests they were representing. Mm. Um. You had regional parties like the Bavarian People's Party that just represented and only ran in that specific region. Um, you had a, a host of those. So the picture I hope you're getting is is extremely fragmented political system where most parties represent only one class or religious group or special interest. And that means that, you know, you are going to get with a proportional system where all of these parties are going to get a voice, all of them are going to get seats. You're going to get, to some extent, political chaos. Yeah, uh, of course. I mean, can you imagine a parliament hall filled up with all these different voices wanting different things for, you know, a small amount of the population for one from one party and then another small amount of the population that disagrees on the other side from another party? Um, and then you have everyone else arguing at the same time. I mean, I imagine, yes, it would be quite chaotic. Yeah, and I mean, um, it, it did render cooperation, which I've just said was essential in this system. You had to have coalitions. But it rendered cooperation difficult because, for instance, um, the you know pro-business DVP would find it very hard to cooperate with the pro-union SPD. Mm -hmm because their interests are mutually exclusive. Um, so the, the other thing as well that fragmented German political life was that all these parties tended to have very, um, the SPD leading amongst them, but all of them to a greater or lesser extent, had very strong and well-developed organizations. So if you were a member of the Social Democrats, Richard Evans um, puts it brilliantly in a, pass a passage, you could, you know, go to a social democratic youth club. You could attend a social democratic choir or sports team. You could, you know, borrow books from a social democratic library, go to a social democratic night school. Mm. Um, 
you'd be a member of an SPD affiliated trade union. You might join their paramilitary protection force if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, they would have festivals and gatherings and pubs or social clubs, all affiliated to the political party. You know, everything from choirs to, to rambling societies, you know, and, and even at the end of your life, you could be buried with the help of the SPD burial fund. Right. So each of these political parties, to a greater or lesser extent, also fragmented Germans' um, social life and the public sphere by the fact that they each had, you know, a sports organization, a youth organization, a paramilitary organization, and their own newspaper. Um, do you know what I mean? So yeah. everyone existed in their own little bubbles along political or, or religious confessional or class lines that equally rendered cooperation more difficult. Yeah, so it's spreading outside of just govern governance and uh, entering the public life. I mean, yeah, you can see how this is um, boiling up to something... Well, something. N not Something not good for Germany. Another interesting aspect of the Constitution, by the way, was the presidency. So... Um, what what it what it laid down was that yes there'd be elections every four years minimum for um the Reichstag to elect a parliament, which we've kind of just gone through, but also every seven years, which is a weird choice, um, you would have elections for the presidency, a direct presidential election on, you know, a person rather mm. than a party. And the president had vested in in their office uh, quite a strong amount of executive power. To some extent, this is rooted in those authoritarian traditions I was talking about, in that they wanted to have a strong head of state, even though this was supposed to be a parliamentary rather than a presidential democracy. And, and also the fact that, you know, the republic was born in a crisis and you kind of needed strong leadership and someone with emergency powers. So the president was the commander in chief. He also retained the Kaiser's ability to hire and fire chancellors, i.e. the government, you know, um, Mm -hmm. But that government did have to have the confidence of the Reichstag. So the president was meant to pick somebody who would have the support of parliament. Um, so he couldn't just pick one of his mates. I mean, I often use the example of in the UK, technically the queen could, you know, has the legal power to appoint anyone she likes as prime minister. You know, they don't even have to be a member of parliament. But if they don't have the confidence of parliament, they can't govern, and indeed they can be removed with a mm. vote of no confidence. So something similar was at play in this constitution in Weimar. Yes, the president chooses the individual, but that individual, um, to head the government as chancellor, must have the backing of the Reichstag if they want to survive and if they want to pass any legislation. Right. The only exception to that was a very infamous article of the Weimar constitution called Article 48. And this article allowed for um, the president to have emergency powers in a time of crisis. They could basically declare a state of emergency if they needed to that would overturn all the civil liberties I've talked about before. And they would also, using Article 48, be able to pass laws by decree, by just announcing them. Um, so the government could promulgate new laws without passing them through the Reichstag without going through the normal due process of a vote through Parliament. So on the face of it, this is seen as a terrible error mm -hmm. because it allowed legally for you basically to establish a dictatorship. Um, the main reason being there was no um, provision in the Constitution that, for what constituted an emergency. There was no safeguards right. on when you could use Article 48, how often you could use it. So President Abbott, um, in his um, seven years in office or, or six years in office he eventually had, used Article 48 no less than 136 times to pass um, presidential decrees. Um, so this is often held up as a fatal flaw in the Constitution, and indeed Hitler would use Article 48 for his own ends. However, there is a kind of proviso you've got to put here. Number one, 
did Germany was Germany an emergency when Pre- Ebert was president? Yes, quite a lot, as you can imagine from what we've described so far. And secondly, there was a there was a kind of hard limit um, on this power in that any presidential decree could be overturned by a simple vote in the Reichstag. Mm. So if the president did something outrageous, the Reichstag could vote down uh, and and overturn um, and repeal, I suppose would be the right word, one of these presidential decrees. On the other hand, the president did have kind of power of the Reichstag because he had the power to dissolve the Reichstag and call fresh elections. Okay. So if the Reichstag was blocking presidential decrees, he could just dissolve it um, and elect and get the people to elect a new Reichstag. So there's definitely pros and cons to this constitution, I think you'll agree. (laughs) Um, The only thing that I would say is a clear negative is that Abbott and his government had obviously made a deal with the establishment, the army we've talked about already. But their principal concern was to prevent chaos and bring back stability to Germany. So the constitution also didn't, um, it didn't clear out the house, if you like. It didn't, um, it didn't get rid of not only the, the army officers and basically the institution of the army, but also the other great institutions were left totally unreformed. By that, I mean the civil service. Uh, the judiciary, the police, the teachers, the professors um, of Germany remained the same. On Mm. the one hand, you could say, well, you know, you've just had this revolution, there's chaos and violence in the streets. The last thing you want to do is try and replace your entire civil service and the whole system of the criminal justice network, etc., etc., On the other hand, all these people tended to be in post because they had been loyal servants of the Kaiser. You know, if you are a police officer, a senior police officer, if you're a judge, if you're a teacher, if you're a university professor, if you're a a civil servant working in an important government ministry, you've probably got there through dutiful, loyal service to the Kaiser's regime. Yeah. And that means you are likely to be not just conservative, but maybe also anti-democratic in your politics. So we mentioned it earlier. um, And I'm sure that at the time it is kind of a sword of Damocles that's hanging over the small matter of the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah, absolutely. Which is obviously really infamous in 20th century history, rightly or wrongly is that the armistice of November 1918 was a ceasefire, but there still needed to be a formal peace treaty to bring the war to a close. And this new republic that's, you know, just been born and had a very difficult birth, the first, one of the first major challenges it has to face is the Treaty of Versailles. And when the peace terms are handed to the Germans, it causes a, you know, complete political crisis. Um, because these new democratic politicians who are in power are horrified, mm. as is German public opinion, by the terms that are laid down. And, and you know, obviously you can find them easily, um, you know, in books or on the online. So it's not worth us running through all the terms of the Treaty of Versailles and why it was so um, hated by the Germans. But the point is, it was harsh. It was, you know, a blank check of payments that... Um, Germans felt was totally unfair and unjust and they thought it was um, a real you know betrayal of of what they thought they were negotiating in reality of course they were defeated power having peace terms imposed on them but you know that's besides the point the the perception in Germany was that this was a a scandal a crime yeah um, and that Germany was being humiliated unnecessarily now, the government, were, when handed the terms in uh, on the 16th of June 1919, was completely outraged. But it was clear, the Allies made it clear that unless you sign, we will resume hostilities. 
so uh, Chancellor Scheidemann, who I've mentioned a couple of times already, resigned rather than face the odium of signing this treaty. He was replaced by another social democrat called Bauer. And his coalition, along with obviously President Ebert above him, faced a really difficult situation. It was a full-on political crisis because most favoured probably not signing this. But of course, the alternative to not signing was a resumption of the First World War. Yeah. So once again, political power deferred to the military because President Ebert telephoned Groener um, in the Supreme Command and said, look, I need yours and Hindenburg's opinion. Can we fight on? Is there any, he said, if there's any reasonable possibility, if there's any shred of, of, of possibility at all that we could succeed if we fight on, we will do it. Um, so what's the army's opinion? Uh, very reluctantly, <laughs> but facing reality, um, Hindenburg was persuaded by Gruner that look, we will be defeated mm. if we carry if we try and carry on fighting. The Allies will conquer Germany. They'll probably break up the country, split it into separate states. Um, you know, this would be an even worse catastrophe than signing the Treaty of Versailles. And Hindenburg once again defers responsibility for a really untasteful, distasteful decision by saying to Groner, right, you tell the president. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he just walks out of the office and says, yeah, okay, you can tell him. So Groner phones up Ebert and says, look, sign. Yeah. We can't fight on. Um, so they sign the Treaty of Versailles. And this really hammers home to an awful lot of Germans, particularly on the political right, the idea that the Republic is somehow a betrayal. Um, it's run by, it's the product of traitors, mm. the so-called November criminals who overthrew the Kaiser and agreed to peace in November 1918. Despite them doing it quite reluctantly and calling the military, asking for their opinion and being told by Hindenburg, yeah, look, sign. Absolutely. So this, um, we cover it in much more detail in the Ludendorff episode, but this stab in the back myth that has its origins in Hindenburg and Ludendorff's scheme to basically shift responsibility for losing the war away from themselves to um, the democratic politicians who take over um, really succeeds. And it's one of the most damaging um, lies in 20th century history. It becomes the foundation, the cornerstone of the German right at this time. The idea that democracy, or this democratic republic at least, is the product of a gross betrayal. That Germany was actually could have won the war were it not for these traitorous revolutionaries and democrats on the home front who undermined the war effort and unnecessarily negotiated peace, leading to our gross humiliation. And despite that advice that Hindenburg gave, um, as we mentioned in our Ludendorff episode, him and um, him and Ludendorff would appear together a few months later at an inquiry into the war and claim that actually it was all the fault of the of the home front and the politicians mm. that the war was lost so adding into all the hatreds and polarization we've talked about is this really damaging myth that it was traitors at home which you know often got distorted as well into jews communists this sort of thing you know building into anti-communism and anti-semitism that was already present um, and it has been labelled the the beginning of the twisted road to Auschwitz, yeah. Stab in the Back Myth. So this was a really poisonous political legacy as well that really, you know, it was toxic to the political climate of, of, of Weimar Germany. Just contributes to the extremism that you will see throughout all of Weimar Germany and into the, well, Nazi Germany. Absolutely. And of course, the, the main vehicle of that extremism at the moment, at this exact moment in kind of 1919 going into 1920, is the, the Freikorps I mentioned earlier, mm. um, who are obviously infuriated by Versailles um, and who, you know, once they've done their job of getting rid of the communists, um, begin, like I said, to maybe turn their attention to the democratic government. And this really begins to kick in I mean, the plotting had started already by the summer of 1919. 
um, people like Pabst, who I mentioned before, mm-hmm. the, who executed um, Rosa Luxemburg, people like General Ludendorff, um, Freikorps leaders like um, General von Lutwitz, have already started plotting now for a number of months about maybe overthrowing the Republic and installing a, a military dictatorship or even um, restoring the Kaiser. And they had formed a shadowy organization known as the National Association, um, which was basically this far right nationalist group, including some of the figures I've just mentioned, including a a far right politician called Wolfgang Kapp as well, who were looking now to to use the power of the Freikorps to overthrow German democracy. And it really came to a head in the spring of 1920 because the terms of the Treaty of Versailles started to come into effect. And one of those terms was that the German army had to be reduced down to 100,000 men and that the German navy had to be reduced down to 15,000 men. So one of the first things the government thinks to do is, right, let's start demobilizing the Freikorps. So how would the Freikorps react to this demobilization? I mean, I assume they wouldn't be particularly happy being told what to do by a center-left government. No, um, and particularly not losing their, their you know, jobs and yeah. weapons and power as well. Um, the first Freikorps labeled for, you know, earmarked for demobilization in um, early March 1920 is uh, something called the uh, Freikorps um, Ehart, which was made up of um, marines and sailors from the German Navy, not the kind of revolutionary radical ones uh, that we mentioned from Kiel, but but rather extreme rightists. Um, and they had been some of the most feared and brutal Freikorps, but also um, as they were Navy personnel officially, um, it was even more expedient to get rid of them because the Navy had to be shrunk right down to 15,000 men. Mm. So these guys were under the command of the aforementioned General Lutwitz, who commanded forces in the Berlin region. And they were stationed about 15 miles outside the capital. And Lutwitz was outraged, not only because we already know he was plotting against the Republic and these were some of his most important troops, if he ever wanted to overthrow the Republic, But also, you know, he had no intention of disbanding troops under his command. So he basically went to the government. He had a meeting with Ebert and the defense minister, Noska. And he basically um, set out a list of demands to the government saying, you've got to ignore Versailles. You've got to hold a presidential election. Mm. You uh, want the government sacked and replaced with, um, you know, a government of technocrats or civil servants. So like a non-political government. Um, and obviously, you know, this was a serving general telling the president, his commander in chief, and <laughs> telling the defense minister, his obviously nominal superior, you know, what to do. Um, <laughs> not just what to do, not just disobeying orders, but telling them to yeah. change the whole nature of the country. And, Taking command. Yeah. So obviously, um, they said no, and they demanded Lutwitz's resignation. Um Ludwig didn't resign. Instead, he went out to the camp of this Freikorps Ehart and they planned a march on Berlin, which was to become known as the Cap Putsch. Hmm. I think we touched on this a little bit again in our first episode. Um, yes, because General Ludendorff was one of the leading lights behind it as well. Hmm. Um, so we kind of did tell this story before. But the key point for our for our story, if you like, of the birth of the Republic is that you've had these far left uprisings and revolts, um, you know, revolutionary disturbances. And finally, you are now getting it from the far right as well. And these fry corps that you've armed are now going to try and overthrow the government. Yeah, it's uh, slightly ironic, but you can I mean, no, hindsight is twenty twenty, but you can kind of see it coming. Uh, like you say. Once they deal with what appears to be the more immediate threat of communism, you can see the Freikorps turning on the SDP. Absolutely. And they they are actually remarkably successful. They march into Berlin, um, even though there's been basically no planning um, for this putsch. Um, and 
they seize the government quarter. The actual government is largely largely flees, um, and it looks for a few days or hours as if the cat putsch has been successful. However, as we detailed um, in the Ludendorff episode, it all falls apart because the labor unions call a general strike and it is extremely successful. Um, everything shuts down. Absolutely everything. You know, they, they can't get their government pronouncements typed up. They can't get any money from the Reichsbank, uh, the central bank, uh, to even pay their, their fry corps soldiers with. They There's no electricity, there's no heating, there's no running water. And after a few days, they realize, you know, the game's up. We can't do anything. We're just a bunch of people living in the government buildings, able to influence nothing. And so um, the government triumphs and um, the, the the putschists flee, basically. And the, the Friar Corps are basically disbanded over the course of 1920. Although, unfortunately, a lot of them become more... Um, kind of underground paramilitary organizations rather mm. than quite so open ones. This obviously is also a bit of a uh, rude awakening for the kind of Ebert Gruner pact policy of cooperation with the army. Uh, indeed, the defense minister Noskara mentioned having used the Fry Corps is totally undermined by this opposition and has to resign. And really, like, I would say this is the Faustian pact coming home to roost because yes these forces helped you defeat the communists but equally there is no love lost between them and the republic and they're quite willing to try and overthrow the republic if they think they can hmm. so um, you know the, the the really crucial point as well is the fact that the, the official German army the Reichswehr um, refuses to intervene yeah they the one of the leading generals, Hans von Siecht, says troops don't fire on troops, basically. Mm. We aren't going to shoot the Freikorps. We are not going to stop them if they march on Berlin. And, of course, this is a hammer blow for Ebert and Noska because, you know, their whole policy has been based around cooperation with the army. But the army under Siecht increasingly becomes like a state within a state. You know, it's an independent political force that looks after its own interests. Mm. Um, rather than be exclusively loyal to the system of government or to its nominal commander in chief, the president. Yeah, so, I mean, the division here that's just happening between the army and the government, I mean, it's a bit of a ticking time bomb, I'd assume. It is, it is. And yet, of course, the cat putsch fails and the Republic survives. And, you know, um, Mark Jones, a historian, he's kind of said, look, the reason the Republic survived this first two years, which was extremely difficult, and you had serious left and up -wing, right wing left and right wing uprisings. Mm -hmm. You had the enormous problems with the end of the First World War and demobilization. You had, like I said, the huge problems that Abbott faced upon assuming office. Mm -hmm. You had the Treaty of Versailles. And yet, despite all of that, despite this enormously difficult birth, this democratic republic just about survives the first few years. Um, and Jones really says, look, this is because they were willing to show that they would use all kind of forces and all means at their disposal to defeat any threats. Mm. And I guess his argument would be if they hadn't been so ruthless um, in putting down left and right, then it wouldn't have survived. Yeah. I mean, yeah. At that, I think I agree, because uh, I can't see it surviving all these uprisings. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, the Fry Corps obviously were incredibly brutal. Um, and, but I mean, it did, could the Republic couldn't survive if they didn't use them. I think, um, as well, the, the counterpoint would be, look, if you didn't have the the backing of the army, if you didn't have the backing of the Fry Corps, would the Republic be able to have survived those first few months 
Um, you know, would Germany not just have descended into actual civil war rather than a state of almost civil war? You know, um, even if you know, you could even say um, if Sikht and the regular German army had been forced or ordered to to put down the cat putsch, would then you've got a full civil war where you had elements of the army back in the government, elements of the army back in the putschists, and you would have had a genuine civil war situation. Um, so, yeah, with hindsight, on the other hand, you would say, look, it's storing up, as you said, some problems for the future because you've preserved the army rather than reforming it. Mm. And it is only very, it's, its loyalty is very, very um, kind of um, based on circumstance rather than any particular uh, love for the Republic. And the fact that as well that you've got this brutal legacy from the crushing of the, the the left in 1919 means that the the social democrats are kind of on their own they're never going to be able to work with elements on the extreme left even when it comes to fighting hitler mm. because of the hatreds from this period um and you could also say with hindsight that ebert overestimated the threat from the far left and he shouldn't have been so brutal um all of that of course is with our privileged position of hindsight. Yeah. So I think, you know, in summary, this was an extremely difficult couple of years for Germany. And somehow the attempt at forming a liberal parliamentary democracy has just about survived it. Yeah. And the question is, where does it go next? How does Weimar Germany continue to survive? Does it thrive? Or... Or oh, worse, well, <laughs> uh, to some extent, it's got to get worse before it gets better. Um, so in our next episode, we will see how <laughs> additional problems can be laid onto, onto these deep underlying issues that yes. already exist. Yes. And yet, for the time being, the system will just about survive. Yeah, well, we enter the Roaring Twenties next. Um, a, a period of decadence... Uh, and I mean, I, I I'm trying to find a way to talk about Babylon Berlin. <laughs> yes, it's a, a, an interesting detective series set in twenties Berlin, isn't it? And it paints yeah. a picture of the um, the cultural scene, which I'm sure we'll get into as well. Um, but also the underlying kind of political extremism that never quite goes away. Mm. Well, if you want to find out more about Weimar Germany, and also if you'd like to find out more about uh, the run-up to what we just talked about uh, today, then you can take a look at our Ludendorff episode. We talk a little bit about Weimar Germany in there uh, and what Ludendorff did during those years. And also um, our next episode will be about Weimar Germany as well, because like you say, this is a series. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to uh, bravely march into the new decade and tell the story of some of the, the greatest crises of um, the Weimar Republic that are coming up, such as hyperinflation and the beer hall putsch, and also some of the, the more impressive achievements, I suppose, mm. are coming in the near future. So subscribe and you will hear the full story. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing it, and uh, I hope our listeners are as well. So, with all of that being said, my name is Peter. And my name's Alex. And thanks for listening to History's Most. Mm -hmm.